Excited to be in God's Word this morning. We're working through the book of Acts. If you haven't been here before or recently, we're working just chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We're in chapter 5 now. If you want to start turning there now, that would be fantastic. Verses 12 through 42 this morning. Last week, you remember, we addressed the Ananias and Sapphira story, pretty intense one, and really, it's interesting because it's sandwiched in the middle of two positive reports. So if you have a, one positive report about the church, and then a pretty intense negative one, and then this morning, back to a positive report, and I think really an appropriate title for this section, I saw it written in uh, my, my Bible and my notes from previous sermon by James McDonald, I really like the title, Unstoppable church, the unstoppable church. There's something about that word unstoppable. In fact, you notice I even amplify the way I say that. In fact, say it to the, your neighbor next to you, unstoppable. There's something about that word unstoppable. That was fun, right? Unstoppable. There's something about that that's compelling. It's something, when something's unstoppable, you're like, oh man, they've arrived, man. That's what we're all going for. We use it in athletics pretty often. Uh, I particularly remember the Jordan era that was, that was the, the term that was always used about Micah. You're like, well, you could, uh, you could try to contain him, but you couldn't stop him. You see, in other sports, that's maybe said of Wayne uh, Gretzky. Uh, you remember his era, pretty impressive. Uh, Tiger Woods in his prime, you'd say, was pretty unstoppable. Tom Brady, as much as we don't like to admit it, has been pretty unstoppable. And even the, we use it for terms of, about teams, not just particular athletes like the 2017 Houston Astros. Sorry, is that too soon? Too soon, too soon. So there's terms that we use that for to describe us in sports, but really the idea is this, is that you may delay, alter, or frustrate them. You may delay, alter, or frustrate them, but you won't stop them. And that's true about the church. That's true about the church, and what's wonderful, that this message is not intended to make you do something different or change something about your behavior. It's really more of an encouraging message that you're not crazy to be a part of the unstoppable church, because we still have the exact same leader, the same power source, the same message, and we're part of the same family as that church back then, and we today still get to be a part of it. We're not just attending something, we're a part of something much bigger than ourselves. Let me pray before we dive into this section of Scripture. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that this morning, that it's an awesome thing to be a part of your bride, your church, your unstoppable church. We thank you for that reality. We pray that that would even sink in more than ever in our minds and hearts this morning, and that we might act and interact differently just out of that basic truth of what we're a part of. God, I pray that you teach us through this text that you'd be great, I'd be small, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. So chapter 5, we're right, diving right in, and it's a, a bigger section that we're going through, so I'm going to read a little, talk a little, read a little, we'll, it'll be a little bit less uh, than, or different than normal, but we'll get through this. It starts with this in verse 12 of chapter 5, now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. I want to just stop there just for a quick second, just if you think about that, that's a pretty awesome thing that once sin was dealt with in the camp, we talked about it last week, once it's been purified, now they're back on track and taking more ground than ever, more ground than ever. And in fact, it's pretty impressive there, it says many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. Many signs, in other words, there's clearly fingerprints, if you will, of God, his involvement is undeniable. His, his hand behind this message that's going out, his, his validating uh, proof is through the miraculous. It's pretty sweet to see. I don't know if you've ever noticed something that's pretty spectacular and you look at the person that's doing it and you're like, uh, clearly there's someone behind the scenes orchestrating that. I was uh, at my daughter who's in fourth grade, Sienna's classroom the other day, and I knew that she had just done these uh, roller coaster uh, project where they had to describe how a roller coaster works, and I remember seeing her working on it. She had a big whiteboard, and she had string that she had kind of taped on it, kind of uh, ghetto-like, uh, just kind of going up and down like a roller coaster. 
I went in and saw the other kids' reports, what they had done. Clearly, parents were involved with this process. They had these electrical systems, this, these carts and uh, motorized things. And I'm like, wait a second. Like, no fourth grade kid made those projects. It's clearly adults at the helm. Someone's working behind the scenes. Any parents here want to confess that you're that parent that likes to make sure your kid's project look way, looks way better than the Kegel's kid's project? And, uh, and so anyway, the idea here is this. Maybe it relates, maybe it doesn't. The big idea that I bring that up is, is because these disciples were just average Joes, nobodies. But God is choosing to use them in a miraculous way. It's important also to understand that it's not a, a miracle working church. It's not as if everybody's going around and everybody's healing everybody. No, God was literally using, it says there, by the hands of the apostles. He's working through the leadership of that church. And look how it continues. It says, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. So basically, in the middle of the temple, we had a picture of this a few weeks back. That was on the far side there. Uh, we remember us talking about the beautiful gate where the leper, uh, not the leper, the lame man was healed. And that's the, the kind of a hangout space. It looks like it's in the shade there. So all the Christians are gathering in one section of the temple because they're still coming together for a time of worship and prayer. And it's kind of the, this hangout spot for these new believers. But it's also become a forbidden zone by those who are brought up by within the, the church system. And we don't know exactly why they're so nervous to be a part of it. Maybe it was because of Ananias and Sapphira. They're like, oh, wait a second, that group calls out people in their sin, and we're not too down with that. Or maybe it's because they knew it was opposing the existing religious system. Either way, it's fascinating to think how opposition often reveals people that are genuine in their desire to pursue God. You see opposition, and you see it in present day in our world, when there's opposition, it actually causes the real and the genuine to come to the surface. And so they held them in high regard, but many stayed away. They kept their distance. I like John MacArthur's quote. He says, fear can keep those who love their sin away and attract those who want the forgiveness of sin near. I like that idea here. So you're seeing that happen within the body of Christ, these new, this new community. Verse 14, and more, listen to this, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. The reason I, I paused there for a second is because you remember how large the church had grown. We talked about it just a couple of weeks ago, around 10,000 people prior to that statement. You're talking about a city of 50,000 people living in Jerusalem during that time and 10,000. And then when it starts to say more were added to their number than ever. I'm like, well, if there is 10,000 and there's more added, you're like, does that mean it's 20,000? I don't know. I'm not a math guy. But all, when it describes it as multitudes being added, this is not a little movement. And whenever we're trying to be made to convince that, that Israel and it, uh, people uh, that are Jewish all rejected Jesus Christ is just not accurate. You see, this, this, this is exploding at that time more than ever. Multitudes, verse 15 so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with the unclean spirits. And they were, what does it say there? All healed. All healed. So the, the magnitude, this, these are crazy times happening in the beginning of the church. Let's just be clear with that. God is doing something miraculous amongst the people of that time. Many coming to see Christ. It says that they're bringing people out. And I love that the, it says on cots and mats. So cots were somebody more wealthy would use a cot. That was kind of like a more prestigious thing. The mats is like something that they carry the poor on. And so literally the rich, the poor, everybody's coming out. They're, say, they're, they're believing there's such a movement happening that what does it say there? That they believe even Peter's shadow is going to heal somebody. 
You're like, woo! <laughs> like, there is something going on. We don't know for sure if a shadow did, but either way, this is a pretty awesome time of God's favor and blessing validating his message in the early church. It's also the first record of influence outside of Jerusalem. They're starting to bring people outside of it. And then again, what I already pointed to, all of them are getting healed. Pretty awesome time in the church. But here's the truth, though. Anytime you have a pure and powerful church, there's going to raise up opposition to that church. That's just how it works. You see, anything that bucks the satanic world system that's in place, that's going to cause a stir amongst those who are part of that system. And that's exactly what happens here in the text. Take a look in verse 17. It says, But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. A high priest, we've talked about him in the last couple of weeks, he, literally a term that's used for two different characters in that, that time. The existing high priest, his name was Annas, uh, and then the uh, previous or former high priest, his name was Caiaphas. You might remember that from the account of Jesus story. Caiaphas and Annas, either one could be uh, being referred to there. I call him Ca- Caiaphanus. Uh, if you want to combine the names. Uh, Pharisees were literally, back in Jesus' time, were the main opposition to Jesus, but now the Sadducees, the religious ruling people of that time, not just the teachers, but the rulers are seeing their leadership and their rule hanging on by a thread. Why is that? Why do you think they're getting so frantic? Why the, the jealousy that's rising up and in them when it says filled with, that means under control of or completely reigning in them. Jealousy had taken over. Why is that? See, because their leadership was just hanging on by a thread. All these people were rising up to follow who? Jesus Christ. And who had they just hung on a cruel Roman cross not that far prior to this? And so literally, they're filled or enraged or or, or completely taken over by jealousy. What kind of a dark place do you have to be that amidst all of the miraculous that they're seeing, everybody healed left and right all over the place, and you're enraged? You're jealous? Like, what is... What is going on? It says something about the state of religious things during that season. So they, they put them, it says, they put them in prison. What's interesting is that's usually an opportunity for Christ to put the spotlight back on himself. Look in verse 19. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to preach. It's pretty interesting, this idea of imprisoning them kind of backfired, right? All of a sudden, what's fascinating to me is the Sadducees. We talked about them a a few weeks back. They have different things that they believed and didn't believe. One of the things that they didn't believe, they didn't believe in angels and demons, So it's kind of ironic that God's like, well, I'm going to send an angel to set free these guys in prison, the the 12 apostles. I'm I'm going to set them free. They're going to be sent because, why? They're not done with what they're doing yet because they're a part of an unstoppable church. God's like, you're not finished yet. There's still a message for you to proclaim. And so what does he have them do? Go right back to the place where they were currently, where they had just been arrested. I love that about God. He's just like, hey, uh, I wasn't done with you there yet, that whole prison thing. Just go back there and start. And you imagine you're getting that message as the apostles. You're like, you want us to do what? (laughs) We were just arrested there. Like, you want us to go back to the same spot? Well, that's going to be fun. And so they totally throw caution to the wind and go right back on mission, not questioning the charge that God has in their life, because what? Sometimes what God calls us to doesn't make sense in our mind, but when he calls you to do something, you you do it. You act and let him worry about the results of that. So they obeyed immediately, leaving the consequences up to God, and look at the message they're told to give. They're told to give 
the words, it says, all the words of this life. You see, we're filled in a world that's trying to connect the dots and make sense out of this life. The wonderful thing about the message that we herald is that it does make sense out of this life. What we're here for, why we were created, what our, our ultimate destiny is, what actually brings purpose and meaning to somebody's life, how we take care of this sin that we all of us in our, our heart of hearts knows we're wrapped in. It addresses all of the things that deal with this life. And he says, you got to get back there on the streets, making sure people understand and get this. So they do that. I love this next section. It says this, now when the high priest came... And those who were with them, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to them the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked, and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the, uh, teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people." fantastic section of scripture. Love this. God, the part I love, is God, God's kind of messing with them, right? Did anybody catch that in there? He's kind of messing with them. When, whenever you take someone and put them in prison and then God's like, go back to that same spot, do it again. Like that, that's, that's fantastic. And you see the account. So you imagine this is the Sanhedrin. We talked about this made up of seven, 71 people. That was kind of the, the governing body of that time. Like the major key leaders, they all got on their, their robes and their headgear and they're looking good and they're sitting there and they, they call out to the, uh, the, their guards and they're like, go bring those men and we'll determine what's going to happen to them. Can you imagine this scene? Like they're all there feeling pretty pompous and arrogant and they send the guy to go get them. And what does it say happens? He returns and he's like, hey guys, do you want the good news or the bad news? They're like, the good news. Uh, well, the good news is the door's still locked. They're like, all right, that's good. That's, that's good. The guard's still in place. The guard's still in place. Yes, we got, we got a good system here. The bad news is the cell is empty. We have no idea where they're at. Like, can you imagine the chaos? And I love the subtlety of scripture. They, they were just a little bit perplexed, perplexed. That Talk about an understatement in scripture. They're like, what the heck is happening here? Like, as if they weren't agitated enough trying to stop this whole movement of Christianity. Now they're like, wait a second, there's an empty cell. And then probably one of my favorite characters in scripture that does, isn't given the name says this, and someone came and told them. Wouldn't it have been fun to be that someone that came into this big pompous setting into the Senate and goes, hey guys, I think the guys you had in prison are back on the street preaching. Isn't that what you arrested them for? <laughs> you know, like he's got to be laughing about this whole thing, totally calls them out. And they're like, are you kidding me? We can't make sense out of this. They're trying to, trying to figure it out. They, they, it, what I love about this, any of you that ever wanted to be a rebel growing up, anybody went through a rebellious stage and you're just kind of, uh, and you maybe wore a, a, a black leather jacket and maybe thought you were cool for a season. If you ever wanted to be a rebel, following Jesus is the best possible way to be that. Not that you have to wear a Harley jacket or something, uh, although that'd be cool. Uh, but, but, but here's the idea. God's all about opposing this broken, messed up, satanic system in our world and bringing the words of life to it. He's all about that. That's what the same message that you hold, that's the same potential that you have. It might stir the pot a little bit. It might, uh, it might uh, cause people to get worked up. But man, talk about a radical, an invitation to a radical life. It's a pretty awesome thing. I like when they bring the disciples from there. They're like, uh, excuse me, guys, could you, 
please come with us. We're not going to try to force you because we might get stoned because the people are starting to kind of like you because you're healing everybody. And so they, they come willingly. The apostles are like, sure, you can throw us back in prison. That was kind of fun. And so, so, so they go back. Look at verse 27. Are you tracking with me in this? All right. Verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Yet here you, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our Father raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. So the high priest, Caiaphanes, was there and he reminds them, you think about this, he reminds them of something I'm pretty sure they hadn't forgotten. You're not supposed to be doing this. We told you to stop it. Why won't you stop it? That he confronts them with that and look at their response. What do, what do they say? The exact same thing they said before. We can't follow you when God's telling us to do the exact opposite. That, that's the same, same uh, re, uh, rebuttal that they come with. You, you, you uh, told us to do that, but we can't listen to you when God's telling us to do the opposite thing. I find it interesting that they don't even mention the fact that they had escaped from prison because they couldn't even make sense out of that. That's not part of the accusations, but look at what the accusation is. You're teaching the people, and you're trying to bring this man's blood upon us. This man, I love that they're not even willing to use the name Jesus. They're just saying, this man, bring his blood upon us. Anybody remember in the scene where Jesus was being uh, uh, tried? What did, what did the people shout out back in Matthew when, when Pilate was like, I don't want this man's blood upon us? What did they say? His blood, Matthew 27, 25, his blood be on us and on our children. His blood be on us and on our children. Now, all of a sudden, they're saying, why are you trying to put his blood on us? Had they forgotten that they wanted it, they invited it to be on them. But now, all of a sudden, when the the crowds, when the masses are are rallying to follow Jesus, all of a sudden, they're like, we don't want to have this this blamed on us. We don't don't want to have to be the, the source and I love that Peter uses this opportunity, one, to speak back, but here's the thing, is he also doesn't adjust his message based on the volatility of the situation. Are you tracking with me? He doesn't adjust his message. He doesn't tweak it. He's like, yeah, Jesus, who you hung on a cross, do you think that's a popular statement when you're standing before the, the council? That Like, no, he literally confronts them again in their sin But I find it awesome that he still points to the hope and potential forgiveness of sin. He points to the purpose of why the the Savior came to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. This is the invite for this this group of pompous priests and, 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 and leaders of that time. He's saying, man, there's still the potential for you to turn. Forgiveness of sin is in this man. This Jesus Christ provides that for you. But they were so enraged. All, they, they couldn't get past the confrontation of their own sin to move towards the good news of the message what Jesus was bringing. Isn't that interesting? Even still th- think today how many people can't get past the, the confrontation, the pointing out of their own sin to move to the good news that the invite is for everybody to come to forgiveness of sin. So it says that they're enraged. They're enraged uh, about this. And it says, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Like, wait a second. What, what in the world moves somebody? I have some people do some, say some silly things to me and make me pretty upset. But how often do I get to a point where I want to kill them? You're like, what kind of a dark place? And here's the interesting thing 
is once you've killed once, it's a lot easier to kill the second time, the third time, isn't it? Right? Why would you guys know that? You shouldn't know that. You see, you see, I'm not speaking from experience, clearly. But, but here's the idea. Some of you are like, yeah, it's true. Once you've killed, that's... Uh, but, but in all seriousness, that, that, the, they're, they're so quick to move past the, like, let's punish them, let's, let's discipline them, let's put them in prison. No, they're moving straight towards the enraged, let's kill them, just like they had with Jesus Christ. But I love, there's a little bit... Finally, a little bit of logic that's brought to the room. Verse 34. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, I'm sure I'm butchering that, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theodos rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan of this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. When they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day. In the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. What an awesome scene here. This continues to, the intensity is brought down a a couple levels by that person, the, the guy who brings logic to an emotionally filled room. Aren't you guys thankful for that person in life, the person that seems to be the more sound, grounded one that brings logic into situations? Who would say that you're that person? Anybody say that you're kind of that logical, more reasonable one? Even in a marriage, there's usually one of you that's a little bit more that nobody wants to admit that because it'd be unlogical to raise your hand and acknowledge it. But here, you think about it, you think about it, it's a blessing that this man chooses to speak up. He's a very well-respected teacher. And you want to know who one of his students were, one of his most famous students of this, of this particular Pharisee? Anybody have? Here's a Bible test. I, I bet you somebody might know. Who? Paul. That's right. That's right. Paul was one of this guy's students. You can read about that in Acts 22, 3. So he speaks up. He speaks up. And what does he bring up? He brings up two different examples, two different examples of times where people had risen up and it had resulted in really nothing. It diffused. After they killed them, they they kind of dispersed and nothing came of it. The first one, we don't know a ton about Theodos, uh, but what is pointed to here. But the other one, Judas the Galilean, is also pointed to other places and talked about in Jewish history. He had raised up a revolt against Roman census, because the census is what they were able to charge taxes based on the census. And literally, that group, even though they dispersed, when you hear in Scripture when it's talking about zealots, that was the group that had raised up. And so they still existed even in that day. But his point was this. He had two different conclusions. I'd say one is true, one is false. The first one is this, is that false things will fail. That's his conclusion number one. False things will fail. I'd suggest that that's not always true. Sometimes false things, we think about even some of the cults that exist in our world today. Sometimes false things continue to flourish. So that was his conclusion. We're glad it saved the apostles, but not necessarily an accurate one. But the one where he was accurate out of the two things is that if God is behind something, you will be unable to. To what? Stop it. Because the church is unstoppable. That's what he's pointing out. He's like, listen, listen, the false things fail was his first one. Eh, maybe some truth in that. But the second one, the idea that if God's behind something, there's zero chance 
of you stopping it. And guess what God is behind? The local church. That's an awesome news for us. That's pretty good news. That, that means that th- there might be seasons where it dips and wanes and does things, but you may frustrate it, you may redirect it, you may, might cause it to take a different course, but you won't stop what God is behind. Pretty much, He's making the case for the theme of our message, the unstoppable church. You might even find yourself opposing God is what He says to them, and they're like, yeah, we don't, we don't want to oppose God. So what does it say that they do? It says that they decided, based on this logic, to release them. I find it pretty dark to think, though. Before they released him, it says that they did what? Beat him. You know, we, we don't know exactly what that is. The standard was 39 lashes because 40 was brought to literally bring somebody to death. So they would pause at 39 just, just to be careful because they want to leave a mark, but they don't necessarily want to kill them. So here, we don't know exactly what that beating looked like. There's part of us that's like, man, aren't you glad you don't live in that day and time, that in a, in a courtroom they can start beating somebody? The, the ones that are assigning judgment are literally the ones also implementing it. Pretty dark day. Sometimes you read about some of the persecution we're going to get to in, this church, in the local church, and you think, man, whoo, glad that's not happening today. I was reading this week, though. On this uh, website, Voice of the Martyrs, think about even present day. This happened in the month of October. Just a couple that they jotted out. Six house church leaders were released on October 16th after being detained for a month on false charges that they had forced Hindus to convert to Christianity. Can you imagine our life group leaders? Oh, you're just in prison for a month for leading a life group. Five men and one woman rejoiced that during their time in jail, they were able to share the gospel with fellow prisoners. The rest occurred soon after state officials passed a new strict anti-conversion law in India. Happening right now in our world. Also, another one. A 60-year-old pastor and his family were beaten by Hindu radicals last month, this is in October, because they refused to stop their ministry work. Members of the radical group, armed with iron rods, and wooden sticks entered the pastor's home and began beating them him viciously. When his 55-year-old wife and 32-year-old son attempted to intervene, they too were beaten. That's present day. That's in the month of October. September. In September, a Christian teenager was beaten to death by classmates after being accused of drinking from the same glass as a Muslim. He had just started at the school in Punjab just three days earlier. Crazy, thinking about the opposition present, the opposition back then. It's still a part of the reality of our world. But the encouraging thing is that the message keeps going on. You can, you, you can, you can do things to thwart it. You can do things to oppose it. But you're never going to stop it. I love even these prisoners present day were like, hey, but it was awesome. We got to share Christ with the other prisoners. That was their mindset back then and mindset still today. And I love that these disciples weren't, or these apostles weren't thwarted by this. They weren't, they weren't like panicking and asking the, the questions like, how could God do this to us? There, there's none of that. They considered it, you see it in the text there, they considered it a privilege to suffer for the name of Jesus. And what does it say they go back to doing? What does it say that they go back to doing? They go back to going door to door, preaching the message. They go back, they're, they're like, hey, just because there is opposition doesn't mean it changes our calling and what our purpose, why we're still left here. We got to get the message out. So they go back door to door, leading, pointing people to Jesus who was the Christ. I find it interesting, and we'll end with this, I find it interesting that it wasn't that they were doing friendship evangelism. It's interesting that we put this uh, certain value on friendship evangelism. I'm saying that's all fine, that we develop friendships and share Christ within those friendship contexts. That, that's important, yes, but this was, this was bigger than this. They're literally going door to door because the message they held had the potential to redirect eternities. There was a lot at stake there, and they weren't putting all their eggs in the basket of maybe someday After I hang out with this person for seven years, there might be this divine opportunity for me to maybe, possibly bring up that I go to church. You're like, really? No. 
They're heralding the good news because they're bold and driven by the Holy Spirit. The encouraging thing is that we have the same spirit inside of us. We're still a part of the same church. We're still part of this, this global enterprise, if you will. We're still following the same Jesus. We still have the, the same power source. There's still the same purpose in all of this. All of this is still the same unstoppable church that Agora Bible Fellowship still is today. Pretty awesome reality. I pray that that would sink into the core of who we are. Let me pray as I wrap up. God, I thank you so much for this text and this picture of the church and what you are doing and how the story seems to put the spotlight on you and your miraculous hand working behind the scenes. God, I thank you for that reality that we get to be a part of that, that your bride is not going to come to an end. The message that we have is not going to stop. This is going to last an eternity. The potential of redirecting people's lives is still there to here today, God. We pray that the, the, the root of this story, that we have a powerful, awesome God that's invited us to be a part of something amazing, would sink into our core. Pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As you're going out today, the very last thing just to mention is we have our own benevolent offering to help folks even within our church that have financial needs if you want to help towards that. Otherwise, have a wonderful Sunday. God bless you.